wishful thinking. Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week. Nuclear Hot Seat traveled to San Diego, California, to cover the hearing in federal court on the $1 billion lawsuit filed on behalf of the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan. These are the sailors who performed humanitarian aid to Japan after the March 11, 2011 earthquake and tsunami. They were hit by massive doses of radiation from the Fukushima Daiichi triple meltdown that TEPCO neglected to tell them was going on. The court received its second hearing yesterday, August 25th, in federal court in San Diego, and Nuclear Hot Seat provides you with a special report that makes you a fly on the wall on what took place before, during, and after. We talked with attorneys Charles Bonner and Paul Gardner, USS Reagan sailor Steve Simmons, and his wife, Summer Simmons. That very special report, plus news, numbnuts of the week, and all the rest, will be coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, August 26, 2014, and here is a brief look at the week's anti-nuclear news. Well, it's only taken six months, but the Los Angeles Times has finally caught up with the fact that there was an accident on Valentine's Day, February 14, at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico. In their article on August 23rd, the Times labeled the accident a horrific comedy of errors. Don't hear anybody laughing about that. They did say that the 55-gallon drum of nuclear waste violently erupted and spewed mounds of radioactive white foam. They said the flowing mass was laced with plutonium and went airborne, traveling up a ventilation duct to the surface. All of it correct. As listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat will know, because we've covered this story from the start. The story did go on, though, to talk about 150 or so workers on the surface of the site who were not told to move to a safe location until about 10 hours after the first alarm sounded. Reuters also chimed in on the six-month anniversary of the accident with some new information, that surface air monitoring conducted beyond the site by facility managers and university researchers in the days after the accident showed detectable trace amounts of radiation apparently had drifted from the plant. However... Additional independent air sampling required of the state was never conducted during the first week. How convenient. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Review of Air Testing found discrepancies in recorded times and dates of sample collections, flawed calculation methods, conflicting data, and missing documents. It also found the facility sometimes said air samples contained no detectable levels of radiation, when measurable levels were present. Of course, WIP spokesmodels are insisting that no one was badly hurt, but at least one worker has come forward with severe medical complaints, and we are talking about internal contamination by radionuclides, which take time to show up. So when they say nobody was hurt by this, they might as well append the word yet. The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission Duck <laughs> and cover report starts with the U.S. admitting that hackers attacking its nuclear power plants have already succeeded twice. One of the hacking incidents, as reported by NextGov, involved emails sent to 250 NRC employees designed to steal their login details, undoubtedly sent by Nigerian widows. Twelve employees actually ended up falling for it, according to the report, and entering their username and password into a Google spreadsheet. 
Another attempt saw hackers embed a URL in an email, like anybody still falls for that one anymore. NRC spokesmodel David McIntyre said that the NRC detects and thwarts the majority of these attempts, but admitted two had succeeded, and it's not known for sure what information, if any, was taken. Our tax dollars at work. A senior federal nuclear expert is urging regulators to shut down California's last operating nuclear plant until it can be determined whether the facility's twin reactors can withstand powerful shaking from any one of several nearby earthquake faults. Michael Peck, who for five years was Diablo Canyon's lead on-site inspector, says in a 42-page previously confidential report that the AP managed to get their hands on and verify that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, is not applying the safety rules it set out for the plant's operation. According to Peck's analysis, no one knows whether the facility's key equipment can withstand strong shaking from those earthquake faults, the potential for which was realized decades after the facility was built. To which Nuclear Hot Seat adds, it was built atop sacred native burial grounds. How's that for karma? So you understand the magnitude of the problem. Diablo Canyon is located halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco on the Pacific Coast and is within 50 miles of 500,000 people. And the whistleblowers are coming out of the woodwork because another one, Thomas Saporito, a former instrument control technician at nuclear power plants in Florida, Arizona, and Texas, spent three years at Turkey Point the Florida Power and Light-owned nuclear plant located in the Miami-Dade area. And he reports on five reasons why Turkey Point could be the next nuclear disaster. It's old. Employees are afraid to report safety concerns, just like at San Onofre. Just like in Japan, Turkey Point is susceptible to a meltdown caused by a natural disaster, in this case a hurricane-spurred tidal surge. The plants spent fuel pools are brimming with danger if the water should boil off or drain away in an accident. And in the last year alone, Florida Power and Light was fined $70,000 for violations regarding their spent fuel pools. And finally, if Turkey Point melts down, Miami is doomed. So when in doubt, duck (laughs) and cover. These next two stories out of Japan bear direct relationship to this week's featured story. Chris Harris, a former licensed senior reactor operator and engineer, reports that many studies show that multiple cores at Fukushima Daiichi, parts of the core, some or even most of it, had been ejected. We always thought, where did the core go after the explosion? It's like it got sneezed out all over the place. It's a huge mess. Marco Kaltofen, nuclear science and engineering expert who presented at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, said, The Fukushima Daiichi accident released very high activity inhalable dust particles that traveled long distances. Airborne dust can transport radioactive materials as isolated individual particles containing high concentrations of radioisotopes. And according to this story from Kyoto News, an official of TEPCO wept at Prime Minister Naoto Kan's office in Tokyo immediately after Fukushima Daiichi as the utility felt it had exhausted all options to prevent the worst from happening. Is that what they said to the U.S. Navy so that the sailors on the USS Reagan would learn that fact? The official reportedly said, I'm sorry. We've tried many things, but we are in a situation beyond our control. Is that what they told the U.S. Navy? On March 14, TEPCO's managing director said, things could get crazy. And they didn't say that to the U.S. Navy either. And if you find yourself in Singapore in the near future, you might want to avoid the rice. That's because the Japanese Federation of Agricultural Cooperatives has announced that they will recommence exporting rice this month from Fukushima Prefecture for the first time since the nuclear accident on March 11, 2011. And the first destination of the rice is Singapore. By the way, the story also relates that a publicity campaign will be put in place to explain that the rice is safe and can be consumed without worry. 
Edward Bernays, you've got a lot to answer for. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that sound a week. Last week on Nuclear Hot Seat number 165, I interviewed Dr. Ian Fairley on his study of more than 60 different scientific studies from around the world, which showed conclusively that children aged 5 and under, living within 5 kilometers, that's 3 miles, of a nuclear reactor, have a 37% increased chance of developing leukemia. This peer-reviewed paper is available only through the academic publisher and to schools that pay for a subscription to the database, though extensive excerpted articles have been published about it in general publications. Well, I got an email from a listener who is associated with McMaster University in Canada. Kevin wrote, I have academic access to the Ian Fairley article through my university, so I went to download it to read. Well, guess what? Issue number 133 is missing from the publisher's database provider. The publisher is El Sevier Science, and the provider of the database is Scholars Portal. He continues, Every other 2014 issue is available in full, from number 127 through number 136, but not 133. Hmm. It is very odd for a single issue to be unavailable like this from a peer-reviewed publication. He sent me a screenshot of the missing spot on the database, and I sent that along with his communication to Ian Fairley, who is pursuing it with great vigor with the database company and the university. Here's my point. Nuclear industry! Dudes! You've got nothing better to do than remove a link to a scientific paper from an academic database? You know your arguments in favor of nuclear are so weak and distorted, so you can't bear to have a paper out there that definitively links your technology, your progress is our most important product, to leukemia in children? And so what? You pay trolls to go out there and take down a research paper that's had a mere 500 downloads? What kind of petty dipshittery is this? This is how you defend yourselves? This is what you spend your money on? Did you think that that would stop us or even slow us down? Guys, guys, you're our comic relief. Even the listener who wrote in said that he found it on a different database at his school, Science Direct. So BFD when it comes to your delaying tactics. So let me ask you, how much money did you waste on the brain-dead troll who came up with that bright idea? Instead of that, why don't you spend it on cleaning up the planetary mess you've gotten us into? Or put it in a fund for those whose lives have been permanently destroyed by your technology? Meanwhile, this story is making Dr. Fairley's study even more of a hot topic in scientific circles, and it continues to trend upwards with scientists, researchers, and academics. If it were made available to our movement, even more copies would be downloaded. Some of them might even be purchased. So nuclear trolls who invade poor, defenseless academic databases to take down peer-reviewed studies with the intent of stopping our movement from shutting you down, I say ha, ha, and ha. You have earned the right to be called this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out a week. We'll have our special feature on the USS Reagan sailors versus TEPCO in just a moment. But first, Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your donations to keep us going and growing. Consider making a single donation, a small recurring payment every month, or put us on your year-end gift-giving list. If you find that Nuclear Hot Seat makes you think, laugh, helps you understand the nuclear issues and not be so alone with your awareness, help us keep doing it. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red donate button. Whatever you can do to help, thank you. This week, I traveled to San Diego to bear witness to the federal court hearing on the case of the USS Ronald Reagan Sailors versus Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO. 
These are the sailors who were sent to Fukushima Prefecture on an humanitarian aid mission immediately after the March 11, 2011 earthquake and tsunami. The Navy was not informed by TEPCO of the severity of the radiation release, the location of the plume, any information really about the plume of radionuclides being released by Fukushima Daiichi's nuclear reactors, or the fact that three of them were in the process of melting down. So the ship passed through the worst of the radiation plume and was inside it for five hours. And initially, when they got to Fukushima Prefecture, anchored close to shore within sight of the reactors. It took several days before the radiological danger was known, at which point the Reagan captain took the ship 350 miles out to sea to avoid the radiation. But the damage had been done. The crew were exposed to high levels of radiation, and the water system of the ship was contaminated by radionuclides. Now, less than three and a half years later, these sailors are sick with rare cancers, internal bleeding that will not stop, loss of bodily functions, wasting of limbs, and many formerly physically fit young people are now confined to wheelchairs. Since the filing of the suit, one has died. This lawsuit, on behalf of 112 named sailors, came up for its second hearing in San Diego Federal Court on Monday, August 25th. The attorneys for the sailors are asking for a $1 billion fund from TEPCO to cover the present and future medical expenses of the sailors, Marines, support personnel, and their families who were exposed to the radiation. TEPCO, of course wants the suit dismissed, or at minimum, the venue changed to Tokyo, which would impose a tremendous hardship on those from the United States Navy who wish to testify in this case. The hearing pitted seven, count them seven, full-time attorneys present for TEPCO against our two pro bono attorneys, a real-life David versus Goliath confrontation. They met in the modern courtroom of Judge Janice L. San Martino. Before the hearing began, I spoke with Attorney Charles Bonner, a two-time former nuclear hot seat interviewee, on what was being considered in the day's hearing and what he hoped would be accomplished. We're hoping that the judge will allow this lawsuit to go forward. Uh, the TEPCO, as you, you well know, has made a motion to dismiss the lawsuit based on what they call subject matter jurisdiction. They're saying that this judge uh, can't decide this case because she would be invading President Obama's area, um, you know, the executive branch of the government, and that the judicial branch cannot get into that lane. She has to stay in her lane. Um, she is mistaken. Um, we don't have any cause of action in this lawsuit that would allow her or require her to invade President Obama's decision to dispatch these Navy personnel to uh, to provide humanitarian aid to the victims of the the earthquake and the tsunami in Japan. Uh, Rather, this is a simple negligence case and strict liability case. TEPCO was negligent. Uh, They were negligent from the beginning in 1965 when uh, this particular bomb was built, uh, and they've been negligent since the time the fuse was lit in 1971, which is when they uh, fired up this um, these nuclear reactors. Uh, GE and Abasco uh, are the American companies that built this bomb, uh, and it exploded on March 11, 2011, and injured these sailors, who are foreseeable rescuers. And whenever anyone in our society is harmed, we rush in to help. These uh, sailors rushed in to provide humanitarian aid. They did not go in to fight uh, radiation or uh, to deal with the Fukushima nuclear power plant meltdown. Rather, they went in to pull little babies out of the water to help little old ladies uh, get food and water and blankets. Uh, They were responding to the people of Japan, not to this Fukushima nuclear power plant, which just happened to be ticking down and ultimately uh, melted down and then exploded. All four reactors, reactor one exploded, reactor two exploded, reactor three exploded. 
that's indicative and positive proof of a design and manufacturing defect as well as ongoing negligent maintenance since the time uh, of the inception of this power plant. And so that was this case was about. And we just have to get her to understand that <clears throat> she doesn't have to second guess the military's decision. She doesn't have to get into the strategy of, of the commanders uh, of the USS Ronald Reagan or the other ships in the 7th Fleet, nor does she have to second guess President Obama's decision to dispatch these sailors to Fukushima, the county of Fukushima. Uh, they weren't going to the nuclear power plant. They were going to the county. It just so happened, unbeknownst to them, they cruised into a disaster. They cruised into a triple meltdown, and, and they didn't know it. They were totally ignorant. And, of course, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, a multi-trillion dollar nuclear utility company, the fourth largest in the world, actively concealed the meltdown. And, in fact fraudulently represented to the world that there was no meltdown, that everything was fine, that the uh, cooling systems were working and was, and these cooling systems were cooling the reactors uh, and that there was no meltdown. That was a knowing lie. That was a total fabrication. Um, but um, nonetheless, um, the judge initially thought that in order to decide whether or not the sailors were injured, she would have to decide whether the Navy was a proximate cause by going there. And she doesn't have to decide there. And that we have tons of case law uh, where judges have been allowed to make decisions about negligent third parties, that is contractors, for example, um, and decide these cases strictly on the basis of, of tort law, negligence, and strict liability. And that's what this case is about. It's a very simple case. So what are the possible results that could come from today? Well, the possible result is that she could um, agree with us that in our Second Amendment complaint, we have only causes of actions dealing with negligence and strict liability against um, TEPCO. Uh, incidentally, we have now filed a motion to amend the lawsuit to bring in GE and Abasco and um, Tahachi and Toshiba. They were the uh, companies that uh, designed, created, manufactured, maintained, and controlled these bombs. But today, there's only one defendant, and that's TEPCO. Uh, uh, the hearing on bringing in the other defendants is going to be on uh, September 25th, a month from today. But today, that's the main option she has, is to allow this lawsuit to go forward against TEPCO. There is a slight, slim chance that she may say, well, I have to decide whether or not the Navy was a proximate cause of the sailors' injuries, and if I have to make that decision, then I'm getting into the executive lane. That's TEPCO's case. That's what they want her to say. Mm -hmm. She would be totally wrong and incorrect. Uh, but if she said that, what would be the option for our side? Well, the, our side would be, one, to uh, ask her to allow us to amend, to eliminate any facts in the complaint that may implicate any kind of proximate causation uh, by the Navy. And alternatively, if she denies that, we'll appeal on that issue. And the case still would be alive as against GE, the Toshiba, and the Hitachi. So we're going to be alive no matter what. That's what I wanted to know. Absolutely. Best of luck in there today. Okay, thank you. I was not allowed to record in the courtroom, but I'll give you a basic play-by-play. -play. The hearing began when Judge Sammartino stated that while she hadn't yet made up her mind, she was inclined to rule in favor of TEPCO because she saw the lawsuit as questioning the judgment of the executive branch of the government, meaning the president, and that was something she was not empowered to do. With that as the setup, the lawyers presenting the sailors were allowed to present. Charles Bonner began by saying the suit had nothing to do with the executive branch of the government or the military's decisions in this case, and framed the argument as one of product liability. He said that TEPCO engaged in fraud and negligence, going back to the original design and construction of the Fukushima Daiichi reactors. 
that the U.S. Navy did not have the full information from TEPCO about radiation risks and the ongoing meltdown when it made its choices about how the ship should approach Japan and where it needed to anchor, and that the court does have jurisdiction in this case. Many precedents were cited of previous cases analogous to this one. He was joined in comments and presentation by attorneys Cabral Bonner and Paul Garner. TAPCO, of course, countered that the U.S. military contributed to the cause of the incident. The radiation devices on the ship should have told them that there was something going on with radiation. The legal equivalent of he said, she said, and the dog ate it. Summer Simmons, wife of USS Reagan sailor Steve Simmons, who's also a two-time previous interviewee of Nuclear Hot Seat, was very clear in her vision of what TEPCO was doing. The attorneys for TEPCO did not deny that there was exposure to these sailors. Right. They didn't. Oh, yeah. They said, yes, we know that they were exposed to dangerous right. levels. It's just not our fault right. that exactly. they were. It's the military. They're saying that the Navy is at fault here, that the sailors are at fault here, that they have no liability or responsibility whatsoever for these 70,000 men, women, and children who were exposed through no fault of their own, through no action of their own. The only reason that they were there at all is because TEPCO said it's safe. Right. And if TEPCO had not said it's safe, Mm -hmm. then the Navy, the executive branch, the men, women, and children who served with or in support of the United States Navy and Marine Corps could have made an informed decision and stayed the hell away from it. After the TEPCO attorneys presented, with their own legal examples, of course, all of which were based upon military combat situations and not humanitarian aid of civilians, Judge Sammartino announced a five-minute break so she could go over some of the points with her assistants. It was a tense time because we thought that a decision was only moments away. As I am recording this, the judge has heard all of the statements by the attorneys, and she said she needed five minutes to go over her notes to see if there were any other points that she wanted to raise. In talking with many of the people who are here, attorneys who are on our side and other interested and educated observers, the general consensus is that she's looking for a way out, that this case is politically a hot potato, and that she really doesn't want it. She doesn't wish to appear to be cold-hearted. She doesn't wish to be seen as a negative force, but she really would prefer not hearing this case in her court ever again. We'll see what it leads to. When Judge Sammartino returned to the courtroom, she called the TEPCO attorney, Mr. Collins, back up to ask for clarification on a term he had used, collateral repercussions. Summer Simmons had some astute observations of what exactly was going down in that courtroom. Mr. Collins um, said when he got up, when he was saying that there was no other recourse, that if she made the decision to um, dismiss this, then every other federal judge would make the same decision and really close the door on that, that there would be collateral repercussions. Um, This is what he said in the course of just the hearing, the main body of the hearing. Yes, um, when he was giving the response to her questions. And uh, at first she didn't really comment on that, and it was only after Paul and Charles uh, got up and had a rebuttal opportunity that she took a a short break and spoke with one of her um, paralegals uh, or law clerks and and came back and called Collins back up to clarify and asked what he meant, whether there was something he had in mind when he said that there would be collateral repercussions. And I have never seen someone backpedal so quickly from a comment. He was caught completely off guard by that. And it was very obvious. He became very nervous and fidgety. And it's like, no, 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 no. We there, we were just saying that there could be, if you were to decide something, and trying to put it off on her, that, that those repercussions would be up to her to decide or some other judge to decide. But what it seemed like was a bully on the playground getting caught by the teacher. And 
it wasn't a pretty sight, but I quite enjoyed it. <laughs> So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that shift that we saw in her when she went from leaning into them to sitting back and contemplating and looking over at my husband and myself while the attorneys were talking, I'm hoping that she had a softened heart. I really am because this is an opportunity to turn it from a corporate story to a human story. Summer Simmons had more to say about the judge's body language and a shocking revelation of what was happening in one of the TEPCO, if not attorneys, a profiler of another sort. But it was time for us to return to the courtroom where Judge San Martino hit us with the biggest shock of all, that she was not going to come up with a ruling that day. She was going to take the information and review it and issue her ruling at some other time, and we were all dismissed. So out in the hallway, we immediately started into our post-mortem. First, I spoke with Steve Simmons, asking for his response to what went on in the courtroom yesterday. I think I'm kind of at awe that TEPCO is still taking the stance that they're going. Away from all the legalese speak, you can argue all day long that the, that the military made decisions to put a $3.4 billion aircraft carrier in harm's way and its greatest asset, the people, the sailors and Marines that were on board. But those decisions weren't going to come without the information from TEPCO. So even, even their argument of, well, the military made a decision and it's not our job as a court to second-guess or question what the military's decisions were, they're contradicting themselves because to, in order to make a decision, you have to have information. And that's the piece that they're leaving out. They're leaving out the fact that, absolutely, they're leaving out the fact that, well, it's my client who provided false information to the Navy, alluding to the false sense of security that, yes, it's safe to operate within the proximity that you're in. And, oh, by the way, I've just put your nuclear aircraft carrier into a nuclear plume that you guys sat in for five hours and now put 4,900 sailors at risk. I would have loved for her to give me an opportunity to talk. Oh, we would too. Because, you know, the the bigger piece for me is this case has more implications than what you see on paper or what they're sitting in here about, oh, well, TEPCO may have to pay out this kind of money in order to take care of the sailors and Marines that were, or an airman that are now injured or ill. But the implications that they're not thinking about is the executive branch and what their thought process is on this. Because even to this day, they're still holding stand and holding firm that there's no risks. And all that information has come from TEPCO. And they are sticking to that. The executive branch, the executive branch is, they've peddled the same statement since March 12, 2011, when we were on station, that there, you can get more radiation exposure from rocks on our soil, which we all know at this point is BS. We all know that's false. Uh, once that Freedom of Information Act statement came out about picking up radiation levels 30 times higher, 150 nautical miles off the coast, that exposure, is that lower than one month of rock, sun, and soil? If so, we, we Americans and every other citizen of the world are straight out screwed. Right, right. And that's the stance that they're trying to take. And that's, and that's the persona that they're trying to give off. They're not using logic. They're not using common sense. Right now they're using cover my ass tactics. And they are screwing everybody else who signed up, rose their right hand, signed that dotted line for everything, including their life, if need be. And like both of you said, we weren't called to respond to a nuclear disaster. We were responding to humanitarian aid to our ally. And as you guys have both made clear in previous interviews, Tomodachi means friend. And yet you're going to turn your back on your ally. You're going to give that proverbial middle finger to your ally and say, screw you, I don't care that your clients went from healthy, active, and 
now some of us are wheelchair bound. Some of us have no control over our bladders. Some of us are having children that are born with birth defects. Some of our the female sailors and marines are suffering gynecological issues. But yet, we're friends. How do you do that to a friend? How do you say, we're going to shake your hand, we're going to be your friend, and we're going to give you a hug, but when the cameras are off, eh, screw you. You don't matter. We're not going to take, we're not going to take care of you. And that's, and that's what frustrates me and is irritating. We didn't know the full ramifications of what we were responding to. We didn't know the scope of how big this really was when we responded. But now that we do know the scope of how big it was, they expect us to turn around and walk the other way or roll the other way. And that's not right. That's not right that they're not going to step up and say, you know what, there are mistakes that were made. There were mistakes that were made all the way back to the beginning of the construction of the power plant, and they continued all the way up until even today when – what was that interview back on um, the anniversary of this year, on March 11th, where they still couldn't find the cores of reactors one and three? Right. Right. You have no idea where your cores are. No, they don't, they don't know. Three years that is a problem. Exactly. It's not like Chernobyl where you can just encase it in concrete. And still, even Chernobyl is uninhabitable. Right. And you have a disaster that far surpasses the catastrophic far surpasses. of Chernobyl. But yet you're going to deem that there's nothing wrong. Yeah. There's no it's harm. Not. There's no threat to any human organism. Yeah, it's more than uh, I don't get it. Attorney Charles Bonner attempted to put the best face possible on the situation. First of all, I grew up in the country in Alabama, and my uncle always told me on the farm it was a poor fox who only had one hole. So judging that she may have done this, I decided that we better bring in GE in Abasco and Toshiba and Hitachi because we continue to do research and all the information is coming out now that these boiling water reactors were negligently designed and in 1965 and that the engineers working for GE, Dale Bradbar and Hotner, as well as Ernie Gunnison, told GE that these were negatively designed and told them to stop. Even the nuclear regulators, regulators told them don't go. GE said in 1971 when they fired them up, they were about to, they were asking for permission, that if you do not allow us to go forward with these boiling water reactors, we, GE, will go out of business. This was the first too big to fail threat. And so the government said, okay. And so we have now made a motion to add GE Ebasco, which is a company now has gone out of business, but they still have an insurance company that have investigated that, Toshiba and Taitachi, uh, on the basis that uh, even though GE designed all of the reactors, this Ebasco company was the architectural that did the actual architectural design. And then... Toshiba and Hitachi came in on reactors three and four. So the point is, now, legally, even if she concludes that she's going to dismiss this case, we have four other defendants. She would be legally wrong. And if she were to do it, we're going to take her to the appellate court and we'll get her reversed. And we'll be right back here. Attorney Paul Gardner, as is his style, minced no words in reporting on his response to the hearing. So how do you feel based on how it went? Numb. The way I feel is frustrated. We filed the case December 21st of 2012. Here it is August 25th of 2014. We're still uh, arguing over uh, verbiage in the complaint. We all know what the substantive matter is, and we all know what the case law is. And if there's some... Uh, reason, technical reason, why it has to be amended or changed in some fashion, we should be given the opportunity to make that change. In other words, we shouldn't be uh, canceled out Mm -hmm. simply uh, by virtue of what we pled so far. And there's no impediment to our going forward normally in a case 
and amending it more than uh, amending the complaint more than twice. I really believe that it's totally premature for her to decide this because she hasn't really heard any facts yet, and she can still make a decision down the road as to whether or not the case should go forward. Mm -hmm. Because in order to do justice, it should be based upon substantive decisions, not upon technical procedural things which can be cured. And there are avenues to do just that under the law. So at this point, we all just have to wait. At this point, we have to uh, pray. We hope and pray that the judge is sensitive to the plight of these individuals and will give them the chance to have their day in court. That's it. If she follows the law and she follows her conscience, she'll have the uh, correct result. And uh, it just seems that um, there's no reason under the uh, procedures or under the existing case law for her to take a drastic step of dismissing, because that's the ultimate. You can't go anywhere after that. Fingers crossed, prayer is in place. After the letdown in court, Charles and Cabral Bonner had to leave for a case they were hearing on the East Coast and needed to catch a plane. So Paul Garner, Steve Simmons, Summer Simmons, and I went out for a post-mortem meal and a chance to rehash what happened. Here's what Steve had to say. On one hand, I'm almost at a loss for words. Um, you know, my my wife and I, we traveled this morning, caught a 6 o'clock flight from Utah down to San Diego, hoping to hear a resolution as far, uh, with regards to TEPCO's motion for either dismissal or uh, change the venue over to Japan. And... It feels like we're, I don't want to say we're starting all over again, but we're, we're, we're left with that cliffhanger. TEPCO's argument of, they're not denying the radiation exposure to anybody, but they're also not taking onus of it. They're putting that back to, they're putting that back on the Navy. And it's all decision, uh, it's all decision making on the part of the Navy of why all these sailors and Marines are now suffering, and it's not right. The common person may buy into their bullcrap. They may hear their argument and feel sorry for them as the corporation and say, here's a couple hundred sailors who are trying to get rich, but that's not the case. Here are a couple hundred sailors who have come forward so far out of roughly 70,000 service members and family members who were in that area at the time. And we want somebody to take responsibility for what is now happening to us. Anybody who actually uses logic is smart enough to realize that the argument of, well, this is decisions that were made on the part of the Navy... Well, let's back that up, and how do you make a decision? You make a decision based on information that's been provided to you. And if misrepresentation of information has been passed down, you can only go off off of what you have. And if TEPCO and Japan is feeding out information saying it's safe, it's under control, there's no problem, then that's what we use. So their argument for me, it doesn't hold any weight. And I'm hoping... I don't like to use hope. One of the things I've always been told is hope is not a strategy. So I don't really like to use... say that I'm hoping for. But I would like to assume that the judge is going to apply logic and during her time of deliberation, trying to think about the case and go through the particulars of the case and the motions uh, from both parties that she will also understand and realize that their argument of, well, this is all a decision, doesn't hold any weight for her either. The attorneys did a fantastic job uh, arguing the, the plaintiff's case, pulling at the emotional cords is always helpful. And when you can put faces to names instead of just looking at a piece of paper 
and say, okay, here's a bunch of names, but what do they mean to me? They're not here. They don't, they don't mean anything. Well, when you can start putting the start putting faces to those names and see somebody in the flesh, and when you have to sit there and listen to attorneys battle back and forth and listen to the attorneys go after the heart, what the men and women of the service have done, not only for our country but for the citizens of Japan, you know, every courtroom has a flag in it. And that flag is a symbol of what we've done and what we represent. And that's how you pull out the cords, the emotional cords of the judge and anybody else in there. And it was, Paul did a fantastic job with that. Uh, when he got up there, he tugged at those emotional cords. And to me, it was well perceived. And you can, you can see the shift in the emotion of the, the judge having to listen to it. On one hand, it's frustrating that we travel down here and we don't have an answer today. But on the flip side, hopefully that extra time will help the judge realize that TEPCO's argument carries no weight. And they can argue till they're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, the facts are what matters. And the fact is, you've got people suffering. The fact is, somebody has to take responsibility of it. And the fact is, it's not our, ta it's not the U.S. taxpayer's responsibility to take the, take the onus of this. It's TEPCO's responsibility. They're the ones at fault. They've been at fault from the beginning. And now it's time for them to step up to the plate and acknowledge that there is a problem and that they knew about the problem. Summer Simmons continued to provide astute observations about what was going on in the courtroom including a rather shocking revelation about what one of the TEPCO, maybe it was a lawyer and maybe it wasn't a lawyer, was actually doing in the courtroom. Steve and I walked in late uh, because our flight was delayed. And so we sat down in the very back of the room. And um, right in front of me, there was a, an attorney um, for TEPCO who had a laptop and he was typing every single thing that was said by our attorneys and he was making observation of emotions he made observations when i reached over and held steve's hand or when i rubbed his back or when he started to feel look solemn uh would drop his head this was actually written into the transcript this person was creating it was he would put in parentheses whenever paul would say something he would say what emotion uh, he was exhibiting, whether it was fervent or heartfelt or um, pleading. And these are all words that he had in his, that he was typing. Um, so it was almost as if they were writing a screenplay. And as regards the judge, you had some very sharp observations dealing with body language and times when she shifted or appeared to shift in her stance. What was your take on what was going on for her? Well, when we came in the room, she looked as if her opinion, as if her decision had already been made. She was sitting forward and to the right, which is uh, the direction of the TEPCO attorneys, um, and leaning into every word that they were saying. Once Paul got up and introduced Steve and pointed to him and said, this is your victim. And, and made it known to her that this is who that was on that paper in front of her. This is the face that went with that name. This is an actual living, breathing, for God knows how long person. Not just a piece of paper. Not just a number on a page. Not just a statistic. This is a person. This man has a wife and children. I said earlier, it may seem rather crude, but I said that the attorneys did a very good job of playing to her ovaries because she's a woman and probably a mother and a grandmother, and that makes a difference. And having that emotional tie every single time she thinks about what her decision means, she's going to see my husband's face. She's going to see his chair. She's going to see him with a wife who is anxiously holding his hand, waiting for some sort of resolution, some sort of answer. And it's going to haunt her, I hope. And I'm hoping 
and I know my husband says hope is not a, you know, a plan, but for me, hope is everything. I am hoping and I am praying that she takes into consideration the moral and the emotional factors that go with the law. Because the law is there, and the law is clear, but the law is precise. It's not soft, and it's not emotional. And us coming today to San Diego had meaning. And our purpose was for her to be able to have an emotional connection to a disaster. And to let her realize that disaster was not just a number. It wasn't just a reactor. It wasn't a corporation. It was 70,000 people who were exposed against their will, without any decision on their part, without any way of getting away from it. There's not just, you can't just walk and say, oh, I'm not going to take a left step. I'm going to take a right step and make this decision that could change my life. There's no way to get off of a ship. There's no way to stop drinking contaminated water once it's gone through the, through the pipes. There's no way to make it undone. And the only thing that can be done right now is accountability. The only thing that can be done right now is for this one person who has the power to say, these people have a voice and it deserves to be heard. The attorneys for TEPCO made it perfectly clear that if it's denied this time, it's the end of the line. There is no recourse. The voice is silenced forever. There is nothing that can be done if this one woman says no. It's denied. It's thrown out. It's dismissed. There's nothing else that can be done. It is completely in her hands, and we are completely at her mercy. As to what we who are not directly involved in this case can possibly do to impact the outcome, Attorney Paul Gardner had this request. I would hope that uh, your listeners would contact Judge Janice L. San Martino in the U.S. District Court in San Diego and express their views on this and, and let her know that uh, these victims are not alone and we uh, all are concerned about the welfare of our troops. Let the court system know how you feel about this and whether you think that this is the American way. If people don't voice their opinions in our democracy, then a lot of bad things happen and only a few people control the outcome of it. And this has such wide ramifications and so many people are affected by it that there should be a loud voice chiming in here to uh, provide at least a searchlight to find out the truth here. And if they close down this case at this point in time, when it's the very initial seminal time in the case, then we believe legally it would be wrong and morally it would be wrong and we have to alert our public servants of that fact. Attorney Paul Garner. I'll leave the final comment on yesterday's hearing to Summer Simmons. Here's, here's a question for your listeners. And feel free to quote it. Feel free to write your local news. Feel free to write your congressman. Feel free to write the judge. If it is not a federal judge's job to stand up for our servicemen and women. Whose is it? Is it Tokyo's job? Is it Japan's job? Is it some Joe Schmo off the streets job? Or is it her job? She's been appointed. She's been elected. She has been duly sworn to uphold the law. It is her job to speak for those who have no voice. And that's all we're asking for. So we do not yet have a judgment on this hearing. This case of the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan against Tokyo Electric Power Company. Nor do we know when a judgment might be made. For those of you who wish to weigh in and make your comments known to Judge Janice Sammartino, her office is in the Edward J. Schwartz United States Courthouse, 221 West Broadway, Suite 4135, Courtroom 4A, San Diego, California, 
92101. And of course, we will have that address up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, on the podcast blog page under this episode, number 166. My thanks and gratitude to attorneys Paul Garner, Charles Bonner, Cabral Bonner, U.S. Navy retired Stephen Simmons, Summer Simmons, and all those who contributed to this case and this report. When there is a decision, you'll hear about it here on Nuclear Hot Seat. A reminder that my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, is available as an ebook on Amazon Kindle. Activist shout outs. Thanks again to enenews.com for picking up the Dr. Ian Fairley interview and blasting it out into the Internet. My numbers keep growing. Molly Martha Lightfoot provided the translation for the article on Fukushima rice being sold in Singapore. And there's a petition on change.org to pardon anti-nuclear activists, 84-year-old sister Megan Rice and two military veterans who protested with her, Gregory Bortier Obed and Michael Wally. The link's on the website. Please sign it and forward it. John Stewart, you may still be on vacation, but I'm still tweeting you about Nuclear Hot Seat for when you take over CNN based on your Kickstarter campaign. For those of you who wish to help, go to the website, nuclearhotseat.com, click on the podcast blog page, and at the top of each of the last three weeks, you will see a tweet. Just click on retweet, and click on favorite once you sign into Twitter, and that's all you need to do. Help us get anti-nuclear programming and information on The Daily Show. Here's today's final thought. I was never in doubt that I would go down to San Diego to cover the hearings for the USS Reagan sailors against TEPCO. The chance to be an eyewitness to history just might be my drug of choice, and I perceive this court case to be one of historic proportions. What's at stake here? The ability to hold nuclear perpetrators accountable and responsible for the consequences of their actions, the collateral repercussions of what they do. The victims are facing down their perpetrators and demanding justice. Right now, this case comes down to one woman, Judge Janice L. Sammartino. She is in a position to determine if this case even has a future. She can deny the sailors their day in court based on hair-splitting a legal interpretation of the rules and wash her hands of this case forever based on a technicality. Or she can rule in favor of the plaintiffs so that they get their next hearing, and the one after that, and the one after that, which, of course, TEPCO will continue to contest, delay, obfuscate, lie about, while they emotionally profile our people. The question is, Is Judge Sammartino strong enough to do what's right instead of what's expedient or technically possible? Whatever she decides, I believe it will make or break her reputation and be the definition of her soul. At least now she has the faces of Steve and Summer Simmons to think about as she takes a look at the paperwork. I encourage you to write a letter to her, make it civil, But let her know how you feel about this case and send it to her at the San Diego Federal Courthouse. Contact info up on the website. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, August 26, 2014. Material researched and compiled from enenews.com, LA Times, Huffington Post.co.uk, Miami New Times.com, KTVU.com, blog.lidor.jp, NHK, Kyoto News, Washington Post.com, fr.news.yahoo.com, Reuters, AP, and the ever popular Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. We're syndicated by UCY.TV and available on AirProgressive.com as well as iTunes. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed for nonprofit groups, blogs, and websites. You have my permission to reuse granted as long as proper attribution is provided. My name and website. If you're for profit, let's talk. I'm reasonable. 
This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of